All right, we're going to get started. These next two breakout sessions are um, focused on evaluations that you can use for sitters and walkers. So Terry and I um, were tasked with reviewing the Hammersmith Functional Motor Scale Expanded, which you'll hear us call the Expanded Hammersmith a lot. Um, we have the daunting task of reviewing 33 items with you in under an hour, where everyone else had far less items. So please uh, be with us when we're trying to go fast, but we want to really try to review things with you uh, thoroughly as well. Here are um, our disclosures. So we thought we would want to know this audience a little bit better, and if you can pull out your um, ARS again, we wanted to know who here have, has reviewed and or, and or downloaded the expanded Hammersmith manual procedures or the score sheet within the last year. It's getting closer and closer to half and half. This is informative for us, though. So close to half of you have had at least your eyes on it. OK, and then our next question is going to be, at what frequency of those who use it, what frequency do you administer the expanded Hammersmith for evaluation of patients? Never, administered at least within the last year, at least within the last three months, or you do it monthly? Okay, good. Thank you, guys. So we have a lot of newbies, but this is good. So this session is really fall, fall, falling under course objective number three, if you look at the um, course objectives for these last two days. And we're wanting to help you determine and apply appropriate clinical outcome measures based on age and functional status while going through correct administration and scoring of um, motor performance assessments using these measures. So I hope everyone has by now picked up a USB, because on the USB out there, we have provided the manual procedures and the score sheets for all of the tests that we are reviewing in the breakout sessions. And so really what we're going to do today, because in an hour we can't cover 33 items in great detail. This is how you score a 2. This is how you score a 1. This is how you score a 0. Instead, Terry and I want to review with you the start and the end positions, what we're testing, and then what kind of compensations you'll see with SMA, and hopefully hearing today's and use, having your manual and score sheet with you um, in your clinic setting, you can be able to administer, administer this test um, with more confidence. And then at the end, um, we'll do a video review and discuss some of the um, compensations and things that we see with uh, three different phenotypes. So Tina set us up really well today with giving you a background of the expanded Hammersmith. It's 33 items that goes through this hierarchical transition of um, gross motor testing. And again, the manual was just revised this last year in 2019. It's also available online if you just Google it on Columbia's website. But again, it's been provided to you. You really need um, pretty minimal equipment to do the expanded Hammersmith. You do need a bench, kind of like a K bench, um, a mat table or using a floor mat. Um, a set of four steps, or the typical therapy stairs that do have a railing, and then floor tape um, to be able to measure out uh, 12 inches for one of the specific items. So general principles of scoring, Tina did review this today, but um, of the 33 items, the total score you could get is out of a 66, and we're using a three-point scale system. So zero is always they're unable to perform the task. A score of one is they perform the task, but with some kind of modification or adaptation or compensation. And a two is that they perform the task without having to adapt or modify or compensate to complete the task. This is uh, the top portion of the score sheet, so you can see all the items are in the first column. Um, the instructions are provided on the score sheet to tell you how to administer what, what you actually ask the patient to do. And then a short description of each uh, score is given for a 2, a 1, a 0. And then um, the column that has S equals is where you're going to put your score. And then I'll tell you about LBC here next. Um, 
So some considerations when you're getting ready to score are uh, definitely contracture development in SMA. And contractures in the Achilles tendons, the hamstrings, the hip flexors, those are the most common ones. And many of those um, types of uh, lack of flexibility and contractures can impact how you would administer these items and impact the child's or the adult's ability to do the test. So using that LBC column, limited by contracture, can help you um, keep track of what items are being impacted by their um, impairments. For testing attire, we want to make sure patients aren't wearing any socks or shoes while doing this test, no ortho ortho orthoses, and make sure that they're wearing comfortable clothing and you know, their skinny jeans aren't impacting their ability to move. Um, other considerations we want to cover in the manual procedures, the first few pages, we have um, positional definitions that are outlined in the manual, so you always know what supine means, you always know what sideline means, and um, four-point kneeling, it's all been predefined. Um, you must, the child must be able to maintain the correct start position in order to do an item. You can place them in the start position, but you cannot help them get to the end position. So that's just kind of a general consideration as well. And if they're unable to maintain the start position or the end position, they're going to get a score of zero. So we're jumping right in. So item one is plinth chair sitting. The start position is they're sitting on the edge of a plinth or chair, feet unsupported, not in a wheelchair, and their back is unsupported. And so we're looking for them to be in the end position of sitting arms free for a count of three. So the pictures here are from the manual, so you can see what a good look of a score of two is. A score of one is with one hand down for support for three seconds. But some of the common compensations you'll see with SMA is putting both hands on the mat or their body for support. Sometimes you'll even see elbows bracing against them while they're holding their hands up or they're holding onto a toy. And I forgot to mention earlier, my little symbols here are X's, mean you cannot give a score for those kinds of compensations. But some compensations you can give a score for, so you'll see a green thumbs up for those. Next is item two, which is long sitting. The start position is sitting on the floor with their legs in maximum extension that they have available again with their back unsupported. And so we're looking for them at the end to be able to long sit with their legs straight, arms free for three seconds. There are some rules where their feet have to be no more than 10 centimeters apart. And knee flexion contractures are okay they can, if they can still do the item even though their knees aren't touching the mat. Um, we just wanna make sure that their knees are in neutral rotation pointing up at the ceiling and they're not externally rotated out. I think we'll save questions for the end if that's okay. You know, the knees and toes have to be pointing to the ceiling. Yep. You try to get them in the best start position as possible that they can maintain. Um, so here, a good example of score of two with two hands up. A score of one is one hand down. And then common compensations you'll see here, like this little kiddo has, probably has windswept hips, as you were just saying, um, unable to keep his knees up in rotation, uh, neutral rotation, so he gets a zero. They also may require both arms for support and also, um, and here is an example of an item that you might mark limited by contracture because of knee contractures impacting their ability to sit in that position. Item three and four is one and two hands to head. Item three is one hand to head. Item four is bringing two hands to head. So again, they're sitting in this nice position on the floor or over the edge of the plinth. Not, again, not tested in their wheelchair, no back support, and we're looking for the end position to be bringing all fingertips above ear level. And ear level is defined as this imaginary line around the circumference of your head. And so as long as the fingertips come above this imaginary line, they don't necessarily have to touch the head. That's the end position that we're looking for. So these are good examples of score of two for item three, a score of two for item four with two hands. But some common compensations you'll see with SMA is they won't be able to necessarily lift, but they'll climb their fingers up. And that's OK, but that's a compensation, so you're going to score them down to a 1. They might flex their head to bring their head to this imaginary ear level line. And that's OK. You just score it a 1. But they're not allowed to have their thumbs supported on their body to get their across that line. And they're not allowed to clasp their hands together to get there either. Next is the rolling series items, and these can be done together. 
Item five is supine to sideline, and then six and seven is rolling prone to supine, and then eight and nine is rolling supine to prone. So item five, supine to sideline, they're gonna start supine, arms by their side or in a mid position, and we're asking them to get into sideline, which is defined as both shoulders perpendicular to the floor and the trunk and hips have to be in line with the shoulders and the body. So the way this item scored is based on what direction they can do it in. If they can roll to the side in both sides, you give a two. If they can only do it to one side, you'd get a one. And if they can't roll to their side at all and meet the end position, they'd get a zero. Some common compensations you'll see here are a multitude of different strategies to roll. They may pull their other arm across their body to get there. They may do all these fancy things with their legs to try and get them onto their side. That's all okay. It's just whether or not they can get to the end position. Um, things that aren't okay though is you may uh, roll their upper trunk but their hips stay behind and they don't get in line with the shoulders. That's not true side lying. And then also we don't want to give them an advantage to grab onto the mat to pull themselves across either. For items six and seven, rolling prone to supine over the right and left side, they're starting prone, arms in a mid position or down by their side. And we're looking for them to roll onto, back to their backs on supine, arms out from underneath their body or their hips. And their hips and shoulders have to be facing towards the ceiling. Momentum is allowed as long as they're not pushing or pulling on their arms. So this picture is a good example of a score or two. He's lifted his arm up and he's gonna roll himself onto his back without any kind of compensation, pushing or pulling. Down here we have a picture of her pushing on the mat to roll on her back, that's okay. She just gets scored down to a compensation for a score of one. They can lock their hands together, they can push on the mat, they can even use their elbow on the mat to fulcrum themselves onto their back. Again, that's all okay, it's just a compensation. But again, grabbing the edge of the mat is um, not allowed. And then the score of zero is because he doesn't make it fully back onto his back for the end position. Item eight and nine, rolling supine to prone. Um, similar scoring criteria in the fact that we want them starting on their backs, supine, arms in the mid position. And again, we're looking for them to get the full end position of prone, arms out from under their body, shoulders and hips facing downward towards the floor. Again, momentum is allowed to try and get themselves there. They can use common, these common conversations of locking hands, pushing on the mat, but not grabbing the edge of the mat. Item 10 is sitting to lying. The start position is sitting on the floor. Um, legs can be in any position, that doesn't matter, um, but their bottom does need to be flat on the mat and we're looking for the end position to be supine on their back, hips and shoulders facing towards the ceiling. And what we're really looking for them to transition from sitting to supine in a controlled fashion, which means that we want to see them either lie themselves down through side lying or by lying themselves down through midline, almost like they're going to do a controlled laying back. Um, they can use their arms and their legs. What we see a lot in SMA is this lack of total control in the proximal muscle in their abdominals and they'll either fall to their side or a lot they'll do a controlled way but it'll be through a fall forward of like a flexion of the trunk in order to get themselves nice and slow onto their side and back. That is okay to do, we call that a turn towards prone because their shoulders are heading prone instead of going to the side. Um, so you would just score them down to a compensation or a modification of doing that task. But again, if it's just a crash and you feel like it's not a safe, you would, you would give them a zero for that task. And so this is a good example of a one of this girl's shoulders positioned towards the prone position and she wasn't able to go through sideline or more controlled through the back way. <coughs> Item 11 is prop on forearms. The start position is in prone, their forehead's gonna be resting on the mat, arms by their side. But what's key here and with another item is their pelvis does have to be in contact with the mat. So if you have a patient with hip flexion contractures and their hips are not touching the mat, you're really not able to assess this item properly. And so you give them a zero and use that uh, checkbox column LVC. This is why they couldn't perform this item. 
And so the imposition is they're propping on their forearms. Their head has to be level with their trunk or above the level of the trunk for at least three seconds. Their forearms need to be down on the surface, their hands not clasped together. And again, the pelvis has to stay in contact with the mat. So this is a really good picture of a girl who got there by herself independently, held it for three seconds, head up, hands down. Some common compensations you'll see is that they maybe can get their forearms to that position, but getting their head up by themselves is not, is not possible. So you are able to, as the examiner, help them get their head up and then see if they can hold it there for three seconds. But then you're going to score them down to that score of one because they needed to be placed into the position properly. Um, you're also not allowed to um, have them support their head under their hands. Their hands do have to be down, so you'd give a score of zero for that as well. And again, if their forearms aren't in contact with the mat. And then this picture on the bottom right just kind of shows, you know, if someone with severe hip flexion contractures, you try to get them prone, you're going to see this little TP above the mat. Again, that would be a zero, and you mark why you were, weren't able to get into the correct start position. Item 12 is lifting head from prone. So again, they're on their stomachs, forehead, forehead resting, arms by their side. But for this item, we don't care if the pelvis is in contact with the mat. They could still be in that TP position if, you, if, you, if they needed to be. Um, and so for the end position, we're looking really for their head to be picked up off the mat, chin clear from the floor um, for three seconds. And the head has to be picked up in the sagittal plane. If they can do it with their arms by their side and hold it for three seconds, they get a school four or two, full score of two, sorry. Um, but if they're unable to do that, then you can bring their arms forward into this mid position and see then if they can pick their chin up off the mat. And if they can, then we're counting that as a compensation and you score them down to a score of one. So some common compensations you'll see here is that they can only lift their chin off the mat momentarily. Um, also when their hand's just in the mid position. Um, but if they only turn their head to the side and they can kind of just wiggle but the chin does not clear, you'd give it a zero. And then this is our picture of the mid position for a score of one. Item 13 is propping on extended arms. So here's the second item where it's a requirement for the start position for the hips to be in contact with the mat. They're prone, arms by their side, and so the in position, we're really looking for them to um, push themselves up so that their elbows are extended and their trunk is extended, but their um, umbilicus is clear from the surface for three seconds. So it's kind of that cobra pose in yoga. That's what we're looking for. The head does have to be up um, above the neutral position, so the, above the line of the trunk. Um, but the position of how they place their hands does not matter to us. They can internally rotate, externally rotate, put them however far or close they need, as long as the belly button is clear from the surface. So some common compensations you'll see here are the arms are too far forward and they're unable to get their belly button up. Um, or they can only extend their chest up, they can't quite straighten those elbows, or the ribs are still touching the mat. Um, and again, as I said, the hands can be placed in any position. So the bottom picture is showing either a one or a two, and I'm saying a one because the therapist, she couldn't get there by herself, but the therapist placed her into the position. If the therapist now removes their hands and then counts to three, she could get a one because she had to be placed into the position. But if the therapist cannot remove their hands and she can't hold it, then she'd get a zero. Item 14 is lying to sitting. So they're starting supine, arms by their side, and we're looking for the end, to, end position to be sitting up, bo bottom in contact with the mat, their legs in the front of their body, but again, their legs can be in any position. We're, we don't really care about alignment just as long as they're in front and they're not uh, sitting on their feet or W sitting. Um, and we're looking for them to get into sitting using side lying or supine. So kind of similar to the other transition for item 10 I, I spoke about. And they're going to get scored down if they end up turning into prone in order for them to come up towards the floor. So this is um, 
the top picture is a nice score of two coming through the side to sit up, but actually the bottom picture is an excellent example of a score of one where they may even roll prone in order to use their arms to push up to sitting. Um, and we always kind of in our trainings talk about the shoulders having headlights, and if the headlights ever go down towards the floor, then that's kind of, <laughs> we're calling that the prone position if the shoulders ever face the floor. Um, many of our patients ask, say, yeah, I can set myself up if I throw my legs off the mat. That does not count. They have, their legs have to stay on the mat. Um, so you'd give them a zero for that. Okay, item 15, four-point kneeling. The start position is they're on their um, stomachs, prone, arms in a mid position, or by their side, and we're looking for the end position to be in four-point kneeling, head extended up, looking forwards for three seconds. We don't really care about alignment too, too much. We generally, four point is defined in um, the beginning of the manual, hands under the shoulders, knees under the hips, but if their hands are a little bit further out, that's okay. If their hips are a little back, that's okay. Um, just use good judgment there. Um, but some common compensations you'll see is that they're unable to get into quadruped independently, and that's okay because one of the compensations is having to be placed, and if they are you place them there, you let go, they hold it for three seconds, then you can give them a score of one. You'll also see some patients may be able to hold it, but their heads drop immediately down. They don't have the neck extensor strength or the trunk strength to be able to hold it. So if their heads cannot stay in line with their body or up, you're going to give them a zero. Item 16 is crawling. So the start position is they're in four-point kneeling. They can hold it there independently. And then you're going to ask them to crawl forwards. And what we're looking for to give them a full score is that they move forward each limb two times. And so what we mean, they move all four points. One arm, one leg, one arm, one leg. That's four. One arm, one leg, one arm, one leg. That's eight. That's two times. So that's what we're looking for. It's important, though, that we don't care about sync Synchrony, syn I can't say that right now. You know what I mean though. It can be any pattern. Um, and also the distance they travel is not important either. Even if they move all four points twice, eight points only two feet, that's fine. We just need to see them lifted from the mat. And then some common compensations that you may see is, you know, they can move both hands, but because of their hip weakness is really, really hard, they might you know, drag and pull, and they can't really pull their legs forward. We really can't give that a score. Okay, I'm passing it over to Terry now, who's going to take you for items 17 through 33. So lifts head from supine is item 17. The t starting position, you're going to um, be in supine with their arms across their chest. You can put, if they're too weak to actually put their arms there, you can do that for them. The end position, you're going to ask them to lift their head up against gravity and look at their toes. Um, they must have true neck flexion. If they only do protraction, then that doesn't count. And they need, they need to hold it for a count of three. I'm going to give you one. Uh, Sally didn't go into this, but three seconds is really and one, and two, and three. I count really fast. Sally's my reviewer for some of the clinical trials, and she said, Terry, you count really fast. So I did like this 30-day plank challenge where you had to do a certain number of seconds, and I was counting. And then one day I looked at the time, and I thought, oh, I really do go really fast. So make sure you're actually around one second, because the, it's important that they hold that for three seconds. Um, some of the common compensations that they may go up into lateral flexion to get up into that position. Um, if they only protract, this is very common, if they only protract but they never actually get that neck flexion, then they only get a score of one. Um, if they, move, they have their arms crossed, they move them down on the side in order to get up, that's a score of zero. So for item 18, supported standing. The starting position is going to be standing. You want to stand. If you're not sure that they can do this, they need to stand near a plinth. You want the plinth or the mat table to be at about umbilicus or hip level. Um, and they need to be barefoot. A lot of kids will tell me, oh, I can do this if I wear my braces. Well, can't do that. They have to have bare feet. It needs to be on a firm surface. I think they do much better on the floor than they do on a mat. Um, but if they insist on using a mat and they can do it that way, that's fine. Um, 
you don't you only want minimal trunk stabilization you they can't lean their whole trunk on the mat table or the plinth um, they can have a little bit of support and then the end position is that they're going to be standing upright on both feet with one hand support for three seconds if, obviously if they can do that without any hand supports they're going to get full credit so um, the one of the things that is allowed Oh, this is a really, in, uh, for a score of one, you can actually have the, ex the assessor put one hand gently on their chest. Um, you don't want them to be holding them up. That wouldn't count. But if they just need that for balance, then you can score that as a score of one. Um, in the one that's showing zero, if they need to have their arms supported, or if you actually need to support their hips or their pelvis, that's a score of zero, and that's not a um, legal compensation. I always tell these kids uh, that that's cheating when they do that, but that those are actually really nice compensations that they can use in everyday life. But for this test, we want to know how strong they are. So they need to, to show us that strength. But in real life, if they can do those things, those are really good skills to have. So for standing unsupported, the testing position, they're going to stand on the floor barefoot. Again, no orthotics. Um, you, you want their feet to be about 10 centimeters apart, and that's about the width of your hand. So if they're standing and you can put your hand down on the floor in between their legs, that's about how far apart their legs can be. Um, and then you, what you're doing is scoring how long they can stay there. And again, Sally has the reminder to count and one, and two, and three, and. So the end position is standing independently on both feet. Sometimes you can actually put them there and then if you let go, they can stand, especially on a brand new stander. You need to be really close to them to guard them. You don't want them to fall, but you want, you want to be able to see if can, they can actually stand there without support for three seconds or more. So common compensation is they might want to lean their trunk on the support service or use hands. You, that's, that's, that's a no-go, that's a zero. So for stepping, item 20, the starting position is independent standing on the floor, barefoot on a level floor, and the end position is they're going to have to take four steps without any aids. Um, scoring is based on the number of independent distance. It doesn't, independent steps, it doesn't matter how far they go. If they take little baby steps, that's okay, as long as they get four steps or more. So, oh, oh, and again, this is um, important, is that they, we see a lot of really um, unusual compensations. They might be on their toes. They might have a waddling gait. They might be very asymmetrical because of a scoliosis. Those are okay. We really don't care what they look like. It's whether or not they can take um, four steps or more. So if they take less than four steps, uh, two steps or more, they can, get, they can get a one. But if they take more than four steps, they're going to get a two. And if they have to hold on to the mat, they get a zero. For, so, for items 21 and 22, these are hip flexion and supine right and left. Um, so you need to check their normal range of motion before you start this. So bring their hips up, see whether or not they have hip flexion contractures. A lot of them have hip flexion contractures. A lot of them have hip dysplasia or hip dislocation, and they may not have full range. You need to know what they're working with before you start. So check that first, and then you can ask them to bring their knee up to their chest. I always laugh when I, the first time I ever do this with any, a new patient, I'll say, can you bring your hip up to your chest? And they say, yes. And they grab under their thigh, and they bring their leg up, and they say, Yes, and I said, oh, no, no, you can't use your hands. So they need to do it on their own. But there's a lot of compensations that are allowed for this. They are allowed to use external rotation. They are allowed to brace their, their heel on the opposite leg in order to get it up. Um, and they can move their leg. If they move, move their leg through partial range, at least 10%, they get a 1. But if they can get that full range, that's their available range, they get a score of 2. They can't use their arms, like I said, and they can't roll to their side. Some of them can get that hip flexion, but only by rolling to their side. Um, that's not allowed either. So high kneeling to half kneel right and left. So it's important to know how we're defining what half kneel on the right and left is. So we're talking, we say half kneeling on the right, what we're talking about is the weight bearing is on the right leg and the left leg is forward. For left, you have left weight bearing is gonna be on the left leg with the right leg forward. So they can use the bench 
in order to get into that position. They can be placed in half kneeling, but in order to get full credit for this, they need to be able to let go of their hands and maintain that position for 10 seconds. This is the only item in the Hammersmith where they're actually doing it for 10 seconds. Everything else is either three seconds or four seconds. This one is 10, so make sure that you're actually counting to 10. That's a long time. Um, this is a hard item for most of the kids. Um, again, alignment is not a consideration. Uh, some of them will do half kneeling with their leg in front. Some of them will be half kneeling with their leg out in external rota rotation out to the side. What they aren't allowed to do is to, you can see the young man in the far right that ha um, uh, is leaning on the bench. That's a zero because he's, he is not maintaining weight. Um, with, you, can, you can get a score of one if you can maintain half kneel with weight on one arm. If you can do it without either arm and for a count of 10, you get full credit. So high, le high kneeling to standing, this is items 25 and 26. So now when we're talking about high kneeling to standing, we're talking it, so right half kneel is actually with the right leg forward. Um, and the weight is gonna be on the left leg. So it's whichever leg that they're actually pushing off on. So the starting position is high kneeling. They need to be able to get into high kneeling. That's the starting position. They need to be able to get into high kneeling on their own with arms free. And the end position is that they can stand fully upright, arms free. This is a, also a really hard item. I don't have very many kids that can actually do this. I'm not positive I could do this on some days. Um, you need to have a bench nearby in case they need to use that bench for balance. If they need to use their arms to initiate standing, um, then they, they'll get a score of one. If they lean their trunk on the bench to initiate standing, that's okay, as long as they're not like wholly, oh, totally supporting their trunk on their arms. Um, you want to see whether or not they can shift. You can say, see in the position of the young man um, um, that's getting a score of one, that he's unweighting his leg. That's what you want to see to be able to score that item. For item 27, stand sitting on the floor. They're really good at this crashing. A lot of kids, they, they, they go into this position all the time. I watch them and I'm just cringing, thinking, oh my goodness, I hope they don't break anything. They need to do this in a controlled manner in order to get credit for this. So they're gonna, the starting position is standing barefoot on a level floor or mat. They must be able to maintain independent standing. I guess this is kind of a no-brainer, but you, they can't be holding on to something and then lower themselves down. They have to be able to stand without any hand support and then lower themselves down. The end position is sitting down on the mat on their bottom with their legs in front of them. You don't want, you don't want them to end up um, sitting down on the back of their legs. You want them to be able to have their feet in front of them, but it doesn't matter if they're sitting in side sitting or they're sitting, any, any other sitting position is okay. Um, they can't use their hands on their thighs or the ground to, be, to get a full score of two, but if they use their hands on the ground or on their thighs or on their lower legs, they can still get a credit and a score of one. Um, this is also a hard item, and so a lot of kids will put their hands on their thighs in order to lower to the ground. But again, that crashing, um, they, if they do crash, they need, to lose, they need to be in control for the first um, portion of it and then they if they lose control on the last 25 percent where they're kind of still easing down that last page that's okay um, if they need to use furniture so if they're holding onto a chair or a bench in order to lower down that's a score of zero that's that's something that's not allowed for item 28 squatting this is the same kind if you're in a p if you're in a class where you're doing squats you can ask them to pretend like they're going to sit back on a chair um, you want them to get to at least 90 degrees of squatting to get a full score and they can't have their hands on their thighs in order to do that so the end position is they're going to be she's really good squatting with their hips and knees flexed to at least 90 degrees and then maintain that so if they can initiate a 10% or greater, they can get a score of one. Um, if they require their hands, you can see in the lower position, she's squatting, but she's got her hands on her thighs. That's also a score of one. There's some kids that will come up and, they'll, and they will say, okay, they're squatting and they might just bend their knees or they might just bend at the hips or um, the waist and that doesn't count either. They're not, they really need to be in that squatting position where you're seeing that eccentric control of their quads and hip extensors. 
So for jumping, this is where you use the tape. You're going to you're going to tape um, two pieces of tape on the floor, 12 inches apart, um, and then they're going to stand behind the one line, um, and you're going to ask them to jump forward and try to clear that second piece of tape with both feet. Um, if they land um, with one foot just a little bit in front of the other, you're always going to use the trailing leg as the one that you measure, but they aren't allowed to, you will see a lot of kids in jumping and in all different gross motor activities where you ask them to jump and they kind of do this little hop. That doesn't count as, as a jump. They have to actually be able to lift their feet off the ground and get forward and land with their feet close to each other on the ground. Um, if the feet are un uneven, and we talked about that already, the lesser distance is used. Um, if they don't stick the landing and they have to they're either fall forward or you have to catch them, that also the scores a score of zero. If you really think they can do that, you could ask them to do it again. Um, for all of these items, if you think that you didn't get the best score and you can have them and safely, you can ask them to do it again, that's fine. So for stair climbing, on, these are items 30, 31, 32, and 33. It's going up and down stairs with the railing and going up and down stairs without the railing. And what you want to look at with this is the number of stairs that they travel and also how much arm support they require. So how many, how many railings they use. So the item 30 is ascend stair with the railing, the starting position. They're, again, they're going to be barefoot. They can't use orthotics. They're going to stand at the bottom of the steps. And the end position is standing at the top of the steps, um, at the top of the fourth step. They can hold on to the railing with this, even at the top. For those of you that do Duchenne studies, when they're doing the, the um, test items on like the North Star, they have to, or on if you're doing time function testing, they have to be standing with their arms at their side. They can still be standing, holding onto the railing when they, when, do they get, when they get to the top. So they can, there's a lot of different compensations they can use for this. They can put two hands on one rail. They don't have to have um, one hand, only one hand on the rail. Both hands can be on the rail. They can have one hand on the rail, one hand on their thigh. Um, but they cannot use two rails like the boy in the lower pit. Uh, picture. They don't get any credit at all if they use two rails. It's a disadvantage we have to those therapy stairs. There's always that other rail right there, so they want they want to be able to to use. If it's there, they want to use it. But we want to try to get them. You may have to coach them through this to ask them to actually turn towards the railing. What you're looking for here is can they use an alternating pattern? In order to get full credit for this, they need to use an alternating pattern, one foot on each step. If they need to do a step two pattern, but they. Can can do that using the railing, then they can get a partial credit and get a score of one. If they can only do two or three steps rather than all four steps, they also get credit for that, but they can only get a score of one. They need to do all four steps in order to get full credit. Um, again, their hands can be on their body, um, on their thigh or on their hip, and one hand on the railing. That's, that's all okay, but not two rails. So the descending the four stairs of the railing is exactly the same, only they're obviously they're going down the stairs. Um, the starting position, they're going to stand barefoot at the top of the stairs. Two hands on one rail is acceptable. They can turn sideways towards the rail if they want to. Um, and then what you want to see is that they're going down the stairs using an alternating pattern. I really recommend guarding them for this. This, this can be scary. I always tell the kids, um, I, this is what I want you to do. I want you to try to put one foot on each step. But the safety is the key. I said, you, we want you to get the highest score as possible, but you don't get any points if you fall down the stairs. And then I have to fill out a really bad report and I get in trouble. So, so really, truly, if you can be right there close to them and guard them and show them what you mean by alternating steps, that you put one foot down, you might have to kind of point at the step and show them where they need to put the next foot. So the common compensations, again, are facing the railing and sidestepping down. If they only go two to three steps, that's a compensation. You need to be, they need to be alternating steps to get the full credit. Um, and if they use two railings, again, they, they don't get any credit for that at all. And if, they, if you think they can really do it, if they, were, if, uh, they weren't alternating steps, but they went down and you think that they, if you show them again they can do it, that's okay to try that again. So going upstairs without arm support. So for, for the next two items, going up and up the stairs and then down the stairs, they 
it can't have any arm support. It doesn't matter how they do it. They, if, they, if they use arm support, they don't get any credit at all. So it's the starting position. They're going to stand barefoot at the base of the stairs. And then the end position is they're going to be at the top of the stairs after having used an alternating pattern, no railing, and um, arm support includes contact with the rail. If they if they touch the rail at all, or they touch their leg, or their anything on their body in order to support themselves, they aren't going to get credit because they really need, in order to get pat, to get a two on this item, they need to be able to not have any arm support and use an alternating pattern. So some of the common compensations, if they can do two or three steps, then they can get a one. But again, they have to do that without using the railing. Um, and if they touch the railing, their body or the evaluator. So if, if you're guarding them and they need to hold on to you, they're not going to get any credit for that and they have to do that. You, you can have them try it again. Um, she's got her hand on her thigh in the lower picture. And so she's, she's not using any other support, but her hand is on her body. So that's a score of zero. So going downstairs, same thing without arm support. They're going to start at the top of the stairs, barefoot. They're going to go down the stairs. They need to use, an, in order to get full credit, that you need to use an alternating pattern. That's key. And they have to do four steps. If they do two to four steps, two or three steps, then they can get partial credit. Um, and if their arm supports the railing or any part of their body during that, or if they'll, they do like a step two pattern for part of it, and then they can alternate for the other part of it, they also don't get credit for that. So two or three steps is fine. Descending the steps in a step two pattern is okay. In, in a step two pattern, that's a score of one. And if they touch the evaluator or the railings, they don't get any credit for that. Oh, so now we have a video review. I did kind of rush through that, Sally. And so um, <laughs> Sally has some three really nice videos that we're gonna we're gonna view. We'll try to talk through that with you. We're both gonna be mic'd up here and and um, see if you wanna. There. So the first patient is a four-year-old boy with SMA type 3. His symptoms onset was 14 months. His parents noted that he was having difficulty with walking and later on that he was having trouble with stairs. He was diagnosed at age 2. He has four copies of SMN2. This is important because there's another SMA3 that does not that has fewer copies and you can see the difference. That, again, that's not we heard about that yesterday. That's not a hard and fast rule, but it is a guideline that usually the more copies they have, the stronger they are. His current motor function is he's walking independently. He could go 201 meters on the six-minute walk test. That's pretty impressive. And he gets a 54 out of 66 on the Hammersmith. You can see he's, they're so cute, So the they? first few items are going to go pretty fast because he's so strong. But we're looking for him to sit independently for three seconds, arms free. Really Long nice knee, kneecaps pointing to the ceiling. Oh yeah, he's got this down. <laughs> One hand to head, hands crossing above the ear level, two hands to head. So these are all good full scores. His rolling without pushing or pulling. So you can see how you score all those together. He'd get full score because he didn't compensate. Wow, that was fast. Sitting to lying was nice and controlled. He'd get a two. Asking him to prop up on Thank his forearms you. and hold it for three seconds, that's a two. Lifting his head up, chin clears the mat for three seconds, that's a score of two. No, he's got his hips definitely on the mat. And now asking him to push with prone on extended arms and hold it for three seconds. Asking him to sit up. You can see a little difficulty there, some abdominal weakness. But he gets there without going through prone, so he'd get a full score. Now we ask him to get on hands and knees from his stomach. <coughs> the, I should be providing better instructions. And then again, just generally, hands under shoulders, knees under hips, hold it for three seconds with the head up. Ask him to crawl. There it goes. There you go. Moved all four points twice. Nice, nice chin tuck. Yep. So we're looking for pure lift in the sagittal plane, keeping those arms crossed. That's difficult for him, so I'd probably score him down there because it's yeah, not a true. He didn't really hold it for count of three either. Yeah. That's a really, she's showing you how to get that, what, what his head needs to look like. Yeah. And he's kind of side tilting and rotating a little bit, so that's a little hard for him. Standing unsupported, he does this great yeah. for more than three seconds. Here's his walking. And so you can see he doesn't have a normal gait pattern, but he, he clearly takes a lot of steps. 
And so his mom told him to do, do your nice walking. So he went slower. <laughs> That's his therapy walk. <laughs> yeah. We take him through full range of motion first. Ask him to bring knee to chest. He gets the full yeah, range. That's nice. It doesn't matter how he does it. It's, it's what we're looking for is just maximum hip flexion. And so he gets it for both sides for a score two. High kneeling on the right. As Terry said, one hand only for a score of one. We're looking to see if he can hold it for 10 seconds. His, his leg. chest can't be touching the bench for this one either. If he leans on the bench, he doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't count. Ideally, you want the bench probably set a little lower, more at belly button height. This is hard for him. Yeah. As Terry said, this one is always a little difficult and always highlights the proximal hip weakness. As you can see, present. he's asymmetrical how much stronger he is on this side than he is on the other side. Sally's such a good guarder. She's got her hands right there just to make sure he's safe. Well, I think we asked now, can you do it with no hands and see if he tries? He's getting there. <laughs> High kneeling to standing. He does require the bench for support, so that brings him down to a one because he does use his arms. And then same for the other side as well. Lowering self to the floor. Yeah. He does crash a little bit, but just towards the end, let's ask him to go slower. He can use the ground, he can use his thighs. He tries without his hands. There. <laughs> Give him a one for that. So as Terry said, we're looking for 10% or more of a squat to be able to initiate. I think that looked like 10% or more. Yeah. So he'd get a one. That was a little skip for the jump there you saw. He's and here he's using one rail only, which is great. A step two pattern. So automatically he can only get a one right now because he's not alternating. And so again, for a one, you can do, you don't have to go all four steps. You can just do two to three. We do ask to see if he can alternate, just to see. Just takes a little extra cueing to tell him exactly the pattern you'd like them to accomplish. Sally's so good at that. She points where to put their feet without actually touching them. That's an art. So Alternating feet going yeah. down is hard. It is really hard. So step two pattern automatically brings them down to a one. There he goes. You can see he's holding onto my hand over there though. That's not allowed. <laughs> so that would be a zero if that was the only thing that you saw there. Any questions or thoughts on him? We still have two more videos to go, but yeah. Wait, hold on. We're gonna use this. Oh, where's the cube? <laughs> Throw it to her. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes. Um, I was just wondering if you can use visual cues on the stairs, like floor dots or stickers, to get them to do a reciprocal pattern. Absolutely. I don't I think know why not. Anything you can do fine. to get what you want them to accomplish. You have to be really creative sometimes with some of these kids. <laughs> oh, we <we're> good. <laughs> <laughs> opportunities would you give the patient to repeat it? Like well, you said, the second time he would be a zero, the time before he was a one, how many chances? I think technically they get three tries, Yep. Um, but I think you have to keep in mind also that fatigue is a factor with all of our SMA patients. So if you can tell they're getting tired, you're halfway through the test, and you and you really, it just it, it's all kind of a judgment. Um, if you think you've seen them do, um, do it another way, and you're really pretty sure they can get a higher score, go ahead and have them do it again. But if they're really tired, then I, I would be hesitant to do that. So the next patient is a five-year-old boy with SMA type two. His symptom, oh, we have one more, one more question over here. 
So I know in one of the earlier presentations they were said that it is not okay to do it by observation from like a video by a parent right. or whatever. But if you've observed the task on a previous day and that it's not part of like that your assessment series that day, then is that considered okay or not? At least what we do for us clinically, it's always the day of the yeah. visit. I you think it's because it's it's a cumulative eval. I mean, you're seeing all of those things. It's not just one piece. So maybe they can do stairs alternating step. If that's the only thing that they can do that, you know, they're doing that day, then that's not the same as going through the entire assessment. So I think it's important um, that you do, that you probably do it as part of it. Yeah. And, but if you've seen it, that's, that's a good reason to ask them to try it again because you can say, I saw you do this the other day. Can you try to do that again? I swear on the day of the test, it never happened. Oh, yeah. I know, I know. And the parents, are they always do the same thing. They send me videos of their kids doing all these amazing things, but then when, on the day of, they, they aren't so good. You have one more question? Yeah, with the prop on forearms, does the head have to be above neutral or yes. just clear the ground? Yes, in line with the body or above neutral. I think we need to jump to the other two videos because we only have about three minutes left. Oh, okay. So yeah. this next one is a five-year-old boy with SMA type 2, symptoms onset at 10 months. The parents noticed he wasn't able to stand and bear weight. He was diagnosed at 17 months old. He has three copies of SMN2 and his current motor function is he walks with a gait trainer. And um, for those of you that aren't therapists, SMOs are foot orthotics or super malleolar orthotics. He gets a score of 28 out of 66 on the Hammersmith. Oh, we'll come back. Sorry, that was me. Oh, oh one. same one. <laughs> I gave it like a three second. There we go. Okay. So he's more of our traditional type two in how he looks. Clearly has some scoliosis, spinal weakness, but we're looking for holding that position for three seconds. That was a quick three seconds. <laughs> That was, that was the kind of counting I do, and one, and two, and three. I want him to score. We're looking for him to cross nice. the ear level without any kind of compensation or flexing. That Sometimes head tilt is pretty classic. Yeah. But he could do it with the other side. So he definitely rolled from his back to his stomach without using his hands. But now you see he has to push a little bit to get himself back onto his back. Here I do feel like patients always trick me a little bit, even though their arms are all the way above their head and they look like they're not touching, they'll, they'll touch them like that. Just ask them to keep their arms free from or one another. Or they'll sneak right up and get the edge of the mat. So now he's going to lie himself down. So already he's flexing his yeah. trunk forward, starting to go into And this, this is the prong. classic SMA position. This is how a lot of the kids, the weak kids do. They, they fold and then they roll to their side. That's, that's classic. I think almost all of my uh, SMA type twos, until they get a lot stronger, do it that way. He's doing a lot of good work getting there independently. He can hold it for three seconds. That's a full score. We're looking to see if his chin clears the mat. He couldn't with his arms down by his side. So we put them in the mid position, see if that helps at all. Doesn't look like it, so he'd get a zero for that. Propping on extended arms, elbows extended. Yep, you she's asking him it. to move his hands back just to make sure the belly button does come up and is clear from the surface. Hold it for three seconds. And Didn't look it. like he was gonna do it, but there he is. Now she's asked him to go and hands and knees. 
a little too difficult. So you can place them there. Then see if he can hold it, keeping his head up for three seconds. It doesn't look like she can take her hand safely away for him to maintain it. He get a zero there. I don't think he clears his head at all. So that'd be a zero for supine head lift. So dad's placing him into a, a standing, independent standing position. We're counting to see if he can hold it for more than three seconds. That's a tricky one. When you read the manual, a one is exactly three seconds, a two is more than three seconds, yeah. and a zero is less than three seconds. So just be mindful of that one. That's a tricky one. Yeah, he's using that external rotation. There it goes. So you got through partial range, you get a score of one for that. And it's always good to try items. I mean, sometimes patients surprise us, and especially if they're going to be on a therapy or a medication or a treatment. It's always great to test new items just to see if they're gaining any new skills. But again, for this, these high kneeling items, they have to be from high kneeling to half kneeling without their trunk leaning on the bench. This last video is quick, if you want to read through it. Sure, so this is a 14-year-old boy with SMA type 3. Symptom onset at 10 months. All these have been pretty much diagnosed at the same age. Parents noted only noted early that he was toe walking. He had experienced frequent falls, difficulty climbing stairs, keeping up with his friends. Um, he was diagnosed at three or seven months. He has three copies of SMN2. His current function, he's non-ambulatory. He's sitting independently. He gets a score of 15 out of 66 on the Hammersmith. This is a good one because you're going to see a lot of kids like this. Yeah. And actually, I think we only show three items here just yeah. to really highlight or a handful of items here, not just three. So he can sit. He's good at that. So this is our attempt to get into long sitting. Dad has to help see if he can even try and get his hip, his legs to be in a neutral rotation position. Did it, we mention that he had a spinal fusion as oh, well? Oh, no, and I, that, that was yes. on there. Yes, he had a spine fusion, which also a lot of kids will lose function if they have a, after they have a spine fusion and the hips become much more prominently tight when you're doing these kind of assessments yes. once you fuse and the pelvis. This is, this is what you see. This is the kind of contractures these guys have, and that really limits the function. Obviously, he can't maintain that position. Rolling is almost impossible because of the amount of hip flexion contractor he has. He's going to try to lift his head. If you've ever tried this, to get in this position and try to lift your head, it's really hard. And then again, you're pulling him out into his maximum leg extension as possible and seeing if they can bring their hips to their chest. Now with some older, more chronic, severe patients who do have severe hip flexion contractures, they actually might be more at a mechanical advantage because of their contractures to bring their knee to their chest. So we've, we've outlined that in the manual that you're really not getting a good sense of their hip strength when they really only have a centimeter to go. So we would make that limited by contracture. You really can't test what that, what that strength looks like. We're definitely up on time. Any one last burning question? Anything that we can? Yep, clinically, it, the recommendation is to do every four to six months during their neuromuscular clinic evaluation. I mean, if you're a treating therapist in the home or at school, whenever you guys need to do a reevaluation, but typically four to six months, I think, is our and recommendation. If you're doing it for insurance verification, so if they're on 
Spinraza, or, and the insurance is going to dictate how often you need to do it. Sometimes it's only once a year. Um, if they're coming into your clinic, we see our clinic patients at least every six months, so it's going to depend on that. But um, if you're needing to reassess for goals, um, you may want to do it more often than that because you want to know what, what goals you want to reset, and especially if you feel like you're seeing progress and you want to know what they're doing. So. Ideally, yes. But it's okay if you need to go back to something. Yep. Ask Sally. No, it's a, She's it's, the therapist. It's an international family, and um, yes, they do everything under the sun. They, they have lots of therapy every day. He, does, he has lots of different devices and equipment to keep him as flexible as possible, and they stick to a strict regimen at home of 30 minutes of stretching every day. You're right. That was really impressive. I, I yeah. Seen yeah. <laughs> Very few, me either. I, I try to encourage them as they're doing it and say, oh, that was a really good try. And they don't have to know that they're getting no credit for it. You know, that's the same thing as that saying, well, for this item, I want, this is what, how I want you to do it. But if you do this at home, that's great. You know, I think that is, if you encourage them and know that they're doing a great job or, you know, if, if you're not doing it for a clinical trial, you can say, oh, this is so much better than you did last time. Um, you know, I think if it's worse, then you just kind of go over it and, and move on and say, we're almost done. <laughs> Yeah, your next like group's Amy, in. Amy and Matt are here. <laughs> Thank you. Here. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.